<laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. God keep you. God cause his face to shine upon you. God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord give you those things that you're desiring in your heart, in your life, in your way, and in his will. Because today, God wants to speak to you. He wants to walk with you and talk with you in a way that you and he have fellowship and communion together, one with another. Today, we're looking in Colossians, but more important than that, when we get together in the Word, when we study together, when we listen to what's being said, when we watch what's being taught, then we need to ask that God would teach us. We need to let the Spirit of God lead us because the teacher as well as the student, the pupil themselves, all are being taught of God. For it is not I that speaketh, but Christ that liveth in me. I no longer live according to the will of myself, but according to the will of the Father who sent me. And God has placed me here in order to relate those things that I pray and ask him to teach you today, that you likewise might inspire me to look at and apply in my life those things that are profitable for eternity, those things that I can use in my life to live forever and ever, those things that are going to show me Jesus. Because that's why we do get together. We don't come together just to worship, though that is a wonderful thing, and praise the Lord, we may even add worship to these services in some way, where we'll be able to play some music, maybe, and sing and dance and laugh and shout, and have joy so that we can enjoy the Word by employing the Spirit of God to teach us, to allow Him to lead us, to allow Him to give us ears to hear what the Spirit may say. So because we know that God is our teacher, that God is our guide, when I look at these scriptures and I share them with you, I don't share them as one who knows. I share them as one who's growing in the knowledge of Jesus. I share them as a person who says, hey, listen to what God is saying. Don't listen to me. Don't follow me, but look at the word of God as he reveals himself to you as you see it before you. Because you have a Bible, and you can open it up, and you can read it, and you can see it, and you can read it out loud, and you can hear it. And then you could fulfill the promise that God has given you, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Father, I pray that this day that you have made glorious and magnificent in your sight, that you would bless your people, Israel, with the knowledge of yourself, but your people that are gathered together in your name, that even call upon you, Jesus, that you would bless them with yourself, that by your spirit you would cause us to hear you, to see you, to know you in a more personal and intimate way than we ever imagined we could. And today you would begin that good work that would continue unto the day of salvation, that we'd be presented before you, faultless, mature, perfect in your sight. Because God, we want to see you. God, we want to know you. God, we want to love you. Amen. And so, last week we were looking in Colossians and God was speaking to us about those things that we are Colossians, that we are actually living through the book itself. And that God was at work in us with grace, that he was going to which is the hope of which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard of the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bring forth fruit as it does in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. In other words, Paul was speaking to the Colossians and saying, look, I've heard that you know, and because you know, it's obvious, because you have joy, because you have such excitement and you are so amazed that, this good work that God has done in you has become so evident to the world that people are talking about you, that it's obvious that you know the Lord, that you have been strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and love suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us to meet to be the partakers of inheritance of the saints in life. So Paul was speaking to them, giving them such great encouragement because he was encouraged. 
the teacher had become the pupil, and the pupil was teaching the teacher. Because of the testimony and the witness of who they were, Paul was blessed. And Paul shared that last week with us as we were looking at Colossians. But this week we want to look at verses 15 through 29 possibly, looking through it, looking to it, and hopefully being brought by it to a place of understanding and comprehending what are the riches of his glory in Jesus that he's given us, that we can see something that we need today. As I've read it and as I've prepared, God has said to me, this is what I want you to talk about. This is what I want for my people. This is what you should say and speak according to what I give you out of your own mouth. And so we read in verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and in you, or and you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Jesus in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wherefore, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. When I consider long-winded, sometimes long-stated segments of scripture, portions of the word, we'd say Parsha of the Torah, <laughs> which is really long-winded, I sometimes get bored. I mean, sometimes some things just don't click right away. They don't connect in a way that's real for me, that's personal to me. So on Sunday mornings, we like to take just one little portion, one maybe one verse, and make topical study out of it so that we can maybe comprehend a little bit better what the overall view is saying. And at Sunday nights, we like to look at the volume of it, like we will in 15 through 29, looking at the entire verse by verse, line by line, examining them and gleaning from them, as it were, chewing on what's being said and seeing some in-depth, really, in this circumstance, deep thoughts, meat material, things that are going to go, whoa, that's kind of deep, you know, that's kind of heavy, you know, maybe we should break this up into smaller portions. We won't, but that's what we usually think. So, looking at this scripture, I would suggest that maybe we might want to take a moment to pause to be still to wait try it see how it works for you stop for a moment walk away come back sit down call it our time of quiet reflection
in this moment of thoughtfulness, in this great pause, I wanted to take the moment to reflect on the work that God has done in my life. God saved me. God has saved you. You have the hope of glory being made work out in you through the grace of God given you. But there is a war that's going on of the flesh and of the spirit. Things that are fighting and working against you and God who is working for you and you are in the middle. You have the opportunity, believe it or not, to defeat grace in some way. In some ways, you have a way of actually abolishing that with which God has done for you. We call it the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and it's the only thing that really can condemn you. I mean, there are some things that can cause you to not be saved because you weren't saved in the first place, according to the scriptures, like being unthankful or not forgiving others. Those are two criteria that God looks at very seriously, and he treats it as though it were your salvation at stake. What that means to you, you'll have to interpret. For me, it means that God can make determination whom he gives grace to by way of the demonstration of his love has already been proven by what Jesus did and what Jesus said. And so all things have been committed to him in that with which we are understanding what I want to call this teaching, the warning. So there's a warning about our salvation. There's a warning about grace. There's a warning to us from the scriptures that we're going to look at in verse 23. But before we do, I want to look at that part where it says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And it's interesting because even as you go back, you keep looking and you say, which you have heard in verse 23, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Every creature has been preached to. You see, there's a, a teaching out that says that we have to go out and share the gospel to this generation. And it's a wonderful teaching. I personally like that idea. Keith Green quoted a statement similar to that that said, this generation is responsible to share the gospel to this generation. You know, and that, that's a good statement. That's technically true. The blood of this generation would be upon our hands if we didn't declare to them that with which salvation has come and the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is kind of like the subtitle of what I'd like to call this message, the warning. Because the warning is kind of clear in verse 23. And let's take a look at that for a moment so we know where we're going with this. If you continue in the faith, period. Let's just stop there for a minute. If. If is a big word. If is kind of like, oops, what if you don't? What if I do? I don't like being iffy. Do you? The question is whether you continue in the faith. If you continue in the faith, in other words, if you continue believing that Jesus has died for your sins, if you continue believing that Jesus has risen from the dead, if you continue believing that God has provided a way of salvation that you should be able to bear, that way of escape that he wants you to have so that you can endure the things that are coming upon the world, the trials and tribulations that have come upon your life, if you can, in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your aggravation, in the midst of the time when you have doubts, and at the end of your life still say, I believe, then the gospel has profited you. And you will be saved. But we do know that there are those who have turned back, turned aside, turned away. And that's kind of why the warning is there in the way that Paul is phrasing it. He says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. I have an interesting thing is that I grow plants. I know what plants are. I know what ground is and I know what settled is. You see, the ground, when it's ground and settled, is something that firmly holds, the roots hold themselves into the ground. And if the ground isn't settled, guess what? When it's all loose and floose, you know, kind of like blowing in the wind, plants get blown over. Roots don't hold plants in the ground unless the ground is solid. And that ground gets packed it in by the water, by the 
we could say the water of the word, by the water, by the wind, by the sun beating upon it, by the constant weather that's going on, the earth gets impacted and impacted. And as the roots are clinging to it, the earth settles and kind of compacts that root ball into a solid foundation so that it is strong and growing up. That's what you are. You're a planting of the Lord, we're told. We're told that you are a, that God is growing you up into the maturation or the maturity or the mature person that you're meant to be, the mature person that you're meant to be. That God is growing you up just like he grows plants. Jesus said it in another way as an analogy in the Gospels by saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. You cannot bear fruit except that you are connected to me. You branch off in different ways, which is obvious. You can see that in your own life. But he's the vine. He is where our sustenance comes from. He is the purpose. The father is the husbandman. The father could snip you off. And quite frankly, if he does, you'll dry up. You'll die out. You'll bear no fruit. And that's where we have to consider well this gospel we've been given that is precious to protect. It's necessary for our life. It's something that we ought to be grounded in and settled in, that we know we are saved. We call it the helmet of salvation oftentimes when it's talked about spiritual warfare in those things that we're attacking as we read even in this portion of scripture where Paul is talking about all things were created by him. If we go back up to verse 16, and for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now, you may not know what a dominion is. You may not know what a principality is. You may not know what a power is at some other time. We may get in depth in explaining it in the spiritual realm because a dominion is simply that area with which there is influence. That power is that capability in that area to have an influence over those that are going on. For instance, like the sun has an influence over plants. The power of the sun is to burn plants, is to bless plants, is to cause them to grow, is to cause them to be nourished, or to cause them to dry up. All of those circumstances are the power of the sun. The sun itself has dominion over the day. That's a dominion, that it rules the day. The sun itself can be circumvented by clouds. So there's certain things that are true in the spiritual realm the same way that the sun is. Light and dark in the same way of fog and different things that go on as far as the spiritual realm is concerned. So there's dominions and powers and I think it's in principalities. And principalities are simply those areas with which the congregation or the community of the environment of people gather together, which a principality would be the environment of angelic beings, but... That area with which certain angelic beings have set up home, so to speak. You know, you could say it that way. It's about the best way to really explain a principality. But we'll get into that some other time. We want to stick with the idea that there are reasons why you need to heed the warning, pay attention to the gospel, be mindful of the hope of the gospel, and be grounded and settled in the word, but in the gospel itself, because... There are principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and dominions that are working against you that you can't see. And you need to understand what you can see of what Jesus has done for you. So that way we put on the helmet of salvation. We say, yes, I know I'm saved, but I can't just act like that's it. I can't just pretend that God hasn't spoken to me, that God isn't directing me, that God hasn't said there's more to it. Because you see, in verse 20, it says, Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross, which by him to reconcile all things to himself. Reconcile means to put in right order, to bring under his authority, to have him in control. Oh, all things by the blood of his cross are brought unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, too, which you are included in that, were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, but now hath he reconciled. He's worked out that issue you have, and he's given something for you to take care of that issue you have, which is 
the gospel. If you continue in the faith. You see, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight, it says in verse 22. In his own flesh, he died. In his own flesh, he has made a way for you to be holy. In his own flesh, by him, reconciling, he has made you unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. By his own flesh. If. Notice verse 24 or 23 right after that. In his body, he's already done it. The work has been done. The work of the gospel has been done. But the working out of the gospel in you doesn't mean you have to fear for losing your salvation. The question is whether you are staying with your salvation, whether you know you're being saved from sin, whether you know that you're being saved from your flesh, whether you know that you're being saved to him. In other words, if it's by him, for him, through him, and to him, all things were created, as we saw in verse, I think it's verse 7, uh, 20, by him, to him, and for him were all things made, yeah, Yeah, there it is. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrown. In verse 16. So it's for his and by his work that he's done of the gospel, giving the good news that God wants to reconcile you with himself, that he's reconciled all things to his son, because the son is the one that could deal with you and I so that we could see the father, we could see God, and by looking at him, we would know that he is the revelation of God, because he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Verse 15, God, if you want to see God, you can't see him, but you can see him if you look at Jesus. Jesus said it to his disciples. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we see in verse 15 the fulfillment of that, or the promise of the fulfillment of that. We see the statement by Jesus and then the, the confirmation of that by Paul speaking to the Colossians that, hey, this is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the very physical representation of God himself in any physical realm that you can imagine. So all things were reconciled to him because he is God. So by his own death and by his blood and by the cross, he's reconciled everything unto himself so that he would judge now. It's true that you have been made reconciled to the Father by this nature with which you are sinful and that you could be made unblameable and unreproachable and that you could be holy before the Father so that you could pray and ask God to lead you and you could ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you and you could be made perfect on that day of salvation, presented before the Father, faultless with exceeding joy that God has begun a work in you. He will complete on the day of salvation if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Now, does that mean that we have conditional salvation? No. Not at all. There's no conditions there. It just says that if you are one of the ones that's saved, great. You'll continue on rooted and grounded. If you're not one of the ones that's saved, then you will not continue in because you'll be like that seed that Jesus talked about. You see, Jesus made it pretty clear. He says, look, word of God is, is, is just like a seed. You know, you, you, you plant it, you know, and you watch it and see if it grows. If it don't grow, it didn't go. So that's what your salvation is like. It's planted in you. Your salvation is planted inside of you. It's the word of God. As you grow, you'll know. Do you know you're saved? Yeah, as you grow, you'll know. Do you know you're saved right now? Probably not. Because you see, the longer you know the Lord, the greater you become confident of your salvation. The less you know the Lord, the more you worry about your salvation. If you're worried about your salvation, rather than belligerent about your salvation, then that's a good thing. But as you know the Lord, you know you're saved because he loves you, because you are in relationship with him. You are talking to him. You are walking with him. You are knowing him. You are loving him. And God loves you. Don't get me wrong. If we continue rooted and grounded, it doesn't mean that, you know, where you have to worry about anything. It means that we have to continue on. It doesn't mean that you wake a sudden, like, checkout line. Oh, well, all I needed to do was, I just needed to, you know, kind of like, uh, go to the supermarket of salvation. I needed to purchase my can of gospel and I picked up some uh, packages of uh, you know good news you know kind of like you know grace wow I want a little gravy with my grace so I picked up some gravy mix you know 
And I went down to the bread store, you know, and I got some buns, you know, because after all, I wanted to throw them in too, and I wanted to have a big feast, you know, because I put them all in my basket, you know, and I rolled up and I said, hey, what's it going to cost me in order to buy all this stuff? Because I want to eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow I might die. So I want to cover my salvation. And so you paid the price. You went forward, you know, you came up to the cash register. You decided to pay for all these goodies you got. Grace, salvation, sanctification, redemption, propitiation, atonement. You know, all the things that are in your shopping cart. You know, you just kind of clicked them and clicked them and licked them, you know, and put them all in there. And you know, said, hey, I want to buy them. You know, and he says, hey, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give them to you free. You know, the only thing you got to do is you got to appreciate them. You got to live with them. You got to do them. You got to be them. You know, but it's on my father's account. You know, so I'm just going to let you go. You know, I'm going to let you take it home, eat it and enjoy and give thanks. And so, you know, you went, cool. You know, and you took it and you took that shopping cart, you know, and you put all your groceries in the bag, you know, and you took it home and you put it up on your shelf and you never again used it. You didn't once take it out, the can out of yams, you know, or the cranberries or, you know, cook that turkey, you know, that, you know, you are, you know, crucified yourself, so to speak, and cooked that turkey, you know, made a feast of yourself, you know, to eat your flesh, so to speak, and drink the blood, you know, so to speak, of the grace and gospel that's been given to you, you know, it sounds disgusting drinking blood, doesn't it? But that's what communion is. So you never once even practice remembering Jesus by doing communion. You know, you went through the motions of devotion but you put all your groceries away. You didn't use them. You didn't participate them. You didn't eat them daily. You didn't participate in what God said to do. You didn't do what the instruction manual says right there on the cans. Open and eat. Expires by. Oh, there's an expiration date? Yeah. Your life is an expiration date. If you don't do rooted and grounded in the word, like it says in verse 23, continue in the faith, grounded, and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature as under heaven, which Paul made minister, that you might move away from the gospel. You might say, well, you know, I got all that food at home, but I think I'm going to go out to the drive-in. You know, I'm going to go through the drive-through, you know, and I'm just going to kind of like, you know, I'd rather go eat out, you know, than eat in. So forget it. You know, I'm tired of this gospel food. You know, I want to go eat some good stuff. I want to go get some gourmet food. So I don't want no gospel food. You know, I want some gourmet food. So you go out and you die. And you die in sin, born in sin, conceived in sin, and you wind up having moved away from the gospel of grace you've been given. God said, look, I've done it for you. All you had to do was continue on in knowing me. All you had to do was just simply open your eyes and see me. All you had to do was realize, I've got it all under control. You didn't have to do anything because, after all, everything has been preached to every creature that is under heaven. You didn't even have to preach. All you had to do was believe. All you had to do was accept. All you had to do was follow me. All you had to do was call upon me. I couldn't have made it any simpler. I didn't want you to go your way. I wanted you to go my way. Are you really content with gourmet food and gospel food? I died for you. I, I gave my life for you. I wanted you to have my life so that I could take away your life and you would live my perfect life. Not your will, not your way of my life, not your interpretation of my life. I wanted to give you me, me. I wanted you to know that I live in you. I wanted you to have fellowship with me. I wanted you to be intimate with me. I wanted you to experience now what I was going to give you later, but you would not. You went your own way. You chose to do what you choose to do today and you walked away. And oh God, I'm crying out to you. Father, help them. Send your spirit, convict them, make them see. God, cause them to hear the cries of those that are in the lake of fire. And the father looks and says, I've committed all things into your hands, son. You have reconciled everything and it's all been done. There's nothing more we can do. 
for those who choose not to follow you. That's a warning. It's serious. I know the gospel of grace. <laughs> I live the gospel of grace. God knows every day I struggle with the gospel of grace. Not because I struggle to receive it. Oh, I appropriate it big time. I want forgiveness. I beg God, please, if there's anything, anything at all that comes between me and thee, remove it far from me. Because I don't want anything to be in my way when it comes to God leading me in the way he chooses. It's like the highway for that stuff. Anything, whether it be possessions, whether it be people, whether it be religions, whether it be pastors or teachers, whether it be elders or deacons, whether it be my own deceptions, whether it be things I can't see, whether it be demeanors or powers or principalities or anything else, I cry out and I say, God, save me. Hosanna. 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 That saved me. Not Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. You know, they try to turn the phrase around and make it a worship thing. It's like, no, it's crying out, save us now. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you thought the gospel is? To save you now? You know, from maybe you got a court case this morning. Tonight, today, tomorrow. Maybe you have a, a bad cancer that's going to kill you. Maybe you have some situation that you can't get out of and you know that the circumstances have arranged themselves. There's no way out. Isn't that what you want to say to God? Save me now. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but today. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, I know that there used to be an old expression that said, hey, you don't, you know, you don't know when, you know, your time is up. But when your time is up, you're gone. Just like that. In the twinkling of an eye, you drop dead, or you get hit by a car, or you develop cancer and you die, or you get shot by someone, or, you know, you die in an earthquake, or a tornado, or a flood, or, you know, the roof craves, crashes in, your heart quits. Boom! In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you die. That fast. That, for you, may be a rapture, or you may die in a long, agonizing death in the hospital or something. But it says something interesting. It says... For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And if he has made reconciliation for you, then what are you fearful of? But to do what it says to do. Be rooted. Be grounded. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled by the very fact that God is saving you. God has saved you and you can cry out to God right now and say, save me now. I need salvation. I need your help. I can't live this life on my own. I can't make the decisions of my life by myself. I need something more than just living for myself. God, I need to deny myself. I need to take up my cross and to follow Jesus because he said I could take up his cross and live with him eternally. And if by that cross, by that very fact that the blood of his cross reconciles all things unto himself, if you're in sin, and if you've really messed up, if you've really screwed up, by the blood of his cross, he has reconciled all things unto him. If you have really blown it, and you have gone all the way down to the depths of despair, and you found yourself like, wow, there's no way God could forgive me. By the blood of his cross, he has reconciled all things unto himself. If you think that you've really like committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or that you've rejected God in some way that you think there's no way he could save you, whether you be a, a murderer, a, a child molester, whether you be a sex offender, whether you be gay or homosexual or whether you be 
El, you know, sec, uh, whether you have committed sex changes and you once were male and now you're female or you once were female and now you're male or you don't know what you are and you're all confused. Either way, God has reconciled all things to himself by the blood of his cross. Jesus has paid the price and done the work that you can have that assurance of that salvation that God will save now and he'll save you to the uttermost. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that anyone, everyone and all people, everywhere and anywhere at any time at any point in time, can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Because he so loved the world, he gave his son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not. Oh, they could perish. They could, if they turn away from that which God is speaking to you today. And God is speaking to you, that's obvious. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. I got hope for you, and I got good news. The hope is that you're going to get it. The good news is that you got it. The problem is, is whether you live it, or whether you'll do it. Because you see, that shopping cart is kind of nice to push around in the store when you're picking and choosing. That shopping cart, you get to lean on. You know, you kind of get to put in it what you want to. And that's who you are, the shopping cart. You can stick anything you want in that thing, but you know what? The day is coming when the shopping cart will be gone. The day is coming when you'll no longer be in that marketplace, picking and choosing what you want to get, what you want to take, what you want to take home, what you want to eat, what you want to prepare, what you want to put in part of your life. You'll be gone. The day will come when there will be no supermarket. There will be no grocery store. There will be no place for you to look, no place for you to live, no place for you to do. No place but one person standing in front of you. Jesus. Because you see, he's the firstborn of all. He has preeminence over all. He has become the... <laughs> Priya, I was going to say... For it pleased God that in him should all fullness dwell, having been made priest through that he sometimes made in the body of flesh, for him to continue in faith, God and word in a creature which is both made minister. Uh, okay, who now rejoice for several of I made minister, which fulfill the word even the mystery which has been doing God made known, which is the glory of the creature, warning every man and teaching every and all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus. Wherefore I also labor, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. So that he is the head of the body, which is the beginning. There we go. And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. You'll be dying soon. You might die today. You might die tomorrow. You'll die one way or another. Whether you're raptured or not, doesn't matter. You'll die. The flesh will die. It's going to perish. Go ahead. Work on it some more. Paint it. Fix it. Build it up. Make it a body. Guess what? It's dying. It's going to die. I can guarantee you that. You will die. The soul that sins shall surely die. And you're going to die because you're sinful. And, you know, that's why the gospels that work in me is like, I was thinking about that while I was reading it. So I was going, yeah, because I also labor striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. To accomplish grace in me and gospel in me, because that's my hope. My hope of his calling is that he'll call me home soon. Whether it be in life or in death or in suffering or in salvation or in exaltation, it doesn't matter. Because I cry out to God, save me today. Save me in this way. Give me the hope of the gospel. Continue to work in me. Present me holy, unreprovable, blameless before your Father in heaven. Let the blood of your cross reconcile me to you. I want you to reconcile me to you. And that's what I pray to God. But what do you do? Do you belligerently go on? You know, kind of pushing the shopping cart around. Like, hey, I got time. I got, you know, Everything solved. I don't need to be saved now today. I could be saved now tomorrow, you know, because, it, you know, I don't want none of that Hosanna stuff, you know. Who cares about Hoshana? Who cares about Hosanna? Who cares? Because I got it under control. Really. Moved away from the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is really... John 3.16, but the hope of the gospel could be born in one word, should not perish, should. That's the hope of the gospel. You see, you should believe, 
you should not perish. The way has been made for you to live. The gospel has been given for you to have salvation. There is a realization of knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way that God wants you to do. And Jesus said, you must, if you follow me. You must give up what you got. You must get from him what you give. Because that's the only way you live. Because if you have anything else in the way, God will not tolerate it. He will have no other gods before him. He will have no other idols before him. He will have nothing else between you and him except for Jesus. Because that's how God operates. And the way that you have to do that is you have to accept the gospel. That God has done it. God has taken everything and placed it in the hands of Jesus. Which means that because everything is reconciled to him, he can say, as he said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And now we read in Colossians why he can make that statement. Because by him and for him and through him and in him and all things were created by him and to him and for him and will he receive the glory. That he can turn it over to his father. Because he's the only one that really will. So where are you at? Are you really content with you know being that hope of the gospel? Are you content with being in relationship of some kind to the church? Are you satisfied with your personal life daily going in and going out and accomplishing some kind of religious thing? Or even ignoring completely religion? whatsoever, saying, well, I got a relationship. I believe. Well, I'm glad you do. But do you know? And that's the problem. Because the hope of the gospel is that very simple statement. God did so love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, you may believe in him, and you should not perish. But this warning is pretty clear. Unblameable and reprovable, he will present you as holy if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Jesus is my hope and my salvation. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. He's the one I turn to. He's the one I cling to. He's the one I call to whenever I need salvation, whenever I need help. Whenever I hurt, whenever I am wounded, whenever I want to have fellowship with my Father in heaven, I cry out, I call out to Jesus. Would you do that today? Would you call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? Would you call upon Jesus right now to be saved? We'll make it simple for you. This isn't an altar call. I'm not calling you to the altar. You've got to do that on your own. You'll figure that one out about what the hope of the gospel is. I'm calling you right now out on the carpet to say, do you want to be saved from what you're going through today so that God can work on you in the way he wants you to go, the direction he wants to take you, that hope of the gospel that you will be brought through the circumstances of your life to be presented holy, unreprovable, unreprovable before God on that day when Jesus will say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, come unto me, because I got you covered. Or whether he'll let you stand before a holy God that has reconciled all things to his son to make judgment. Have you done what Jesus said? Are you coming unto him? Call upon the name of the Lord right now. Listen to what I'm saying and then just do it your way. Do it any way you want to. I don't care how you do it. I care you do it. Jesus, help. Jesus, save me. Jesus, come to me right now. God, I'm calling unto you. Save me now. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Who cares what religion? Save me now. Save me also for tomorrow, but tomorrow will take care of itself. But God, save me now. And don't let me ever forget that every day to wake up and ask that you would save me now. Because that's really what you need. Because it's a warning. And I'm giving you that very clear warning for the scriptures from Colossians. From what God said for me to speak to you today. There's a warning going out about the gospel and about the gospel of grace and the things that have been done. God has reconciled everything to himself already. Everything's done. As far as he's concerned, it's just unfolding for us to see what he's already accomplished. And everything will be revealed as it's already been done. And we're just living through it now. God's already seen the end. God's already lived the end. It's already done in his sight. 
So whether you're saved or whether you're not, you choose today to be saved. Choose this moment to know Jesus. Choose right now to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Jesus, save me. Amen. Amen? <laughs> To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Oh, I pray that God would be in you, that God would be with you, that God would be for you, that God would conform you, that God would lift you up unto himself by his own hands, and he would look at you and breathe upon you and give you the gift of his Holy Spirit, that he would fill you to overflowing, that he would cause you to keep growing, that you would go forward in the joy of the Lord, that you would know the riches of his glory, that it would be expressive in your life, that you would demonstrate by your light who you are and what you are, that you would laugh and sing and dance and see this day that you have come unto that place of salvation, knowing and experiencing God in the most powerful way that he could demonstrate his love towards you. And that is in Jesus. <laughs>